and good morning, everyone. I'm really excited today to introduce a topic, sorry, a project that I've been working on now for the best part of a year. Um, this is a topic that is incredibly prevalent within our contemporary um, social discourse, however, remains powerfully rooted in a long and complex history that demands to be understood. I would like to talk today about Putin's special operation in Ukraine. Wearing a number of shifting and ever-evolving faces, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, justified as a buttress against encroaching NATO aggression, a crusade in reclaiming long-lost Russian lands, and a valiant pushback against the US empire of lies, the task of understanding this modern conflict has become increasingly complex. We have arrived at an incredibly significant moment in history. The outbreak of the war that must not be called a war marks a catastrophe that for the, catastrophe that for the Russian people is forbidden in recognition, acknowledgement, and definition beyond the confines of a state-condoned vocabulary. Amidst a discourse of shifting justifications, concealed statistics, and inherent uncertainty, the changing face of Russia's invasion in Ukraine reflects a political system rooted in arbitrary and increasingly disconnected conceptions of truth. We've become all too familiar in recent years with the notion of alternative facts fake news and a pandemic of disinformation sweeping the modern information space. The current conflict in Ukraine has been described as a battleground of competing Western and Russian realities, a contrasting interpretations of global tension weaponized towards a legitimizing end. For a little over a year, Vladimir Putin has justified his special operation in Ukraine through a brandishing of what we might describe as alternative history, laying claim to a neighboring territory through narratives such as that of the Kievan Rus, the first great Russian state encompassing modern Ukraine within its mythical 10th century borders. Since his accession to power at the turn of the 21st century, Vladimir Putin has remained staunchly committed to a rehabilitation of Russia's glorious past and has sought to rebuild a cohesive post-Soviet identity upon foundations of historic national greatness. Such greatness, however, stands upon shaky epistemological foundations and is corroborated by a largely imagined, idealized retelling of historical events. In a world where history, collective memory, and national identity have become things to create, we might recognize Putin's invasion of Ukraine as far more than just a struggle between dichotomous political ideologies. Armed with a volatile and largely fabricated account of national history, the Russian president stands today on the front lines of a war also waged against his own people, between state condoned and individual vocabularies of truth. According to renowned feminist Judith Butler, humans are intrinsically linguistic beings, requiring language and its framework of correlation between symbol and reality in order to be. Butler argues that humans are, in this sense, formed within language and survive within its terms. She continues in excitable speech, a politics of the performative. Language sustains the body not by bringing it into being or feeding it in a literal way. Rather, it is by being interpolated within the terms of language that a certain social existence of the body first becomes possible. Here we may comprehend the power of discourse, our human dwelling within its linguistic confines and capacity for definition, a personal truth within its terms. Human language is imbued by history, a framework that is dynamic and ever shifting, yet rooted within perceptions of lived reality and collective memory. Understanding the Russian psyche and deciphering current sentiment towards the conflict in Ukraine is impossible without first comprehending language's inherent force. Within a socio-political context, the ways in which we articulate reality are all-consuming, capable, according to Judith Butler, of debunking childish or unacknowledged points of view, upending subtle understanding, or shifting the horizons of possibility. Through the process of ascribing symbolic meaning to words, we decide the world we want to create and possess the power to redefine accounts of lived experience, remolding history and identity. In the words of George Orwell, he who controls the past controls the future. He who controls the present controls the past. To control the narrative of collective memory in our modern world is to possess ultimate and absolute power over our fellow humanity. As Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky appeals to the international community, pleading for a filling of the dead silence wrought by Russian bombs upon his country with music and voices, the Russian people reckon with a silence of their own, once saturated by the rotting remains of a real and violent, unacknowledged Soviet history. To the Western world, such silence is deafening, a symbol of complicity and a moral sanctioning of the atrocities of Putin's war. For Russians, however, the silence hold a deep, holds a deep and enigmatic cultural nuance, emblematic of a distinctive national identity cast in the shadows of traumatic past. 
The Russian people possess a long and complex relationship with truth by virtue of such a historic familiarity with violence and repression. The reign of Joseph Stalin, beginning in the mid-1920s, was characterized by censorship and the formulation of new political and cultural dialects designed to legitimize state authority. A stifling of free speech was achieved by the threat of death or condemnation to a lifetime of suffering in the gulag labor camp system. In this sense, the reality of Soviet existence found itself remolded by an unspoken yet omnipresent state-enforced terror. As violence and fear pervaded every aspect of daily life, a national an official national identity was reconstructed upon artificial foundations. Under Stalin's terror, cultural discourse was rewired by fear, reflecting a false and idealized Soviet existence. As Judith Butler expresses the capacity of language to sustain the body, harboring us within its form, we are confronted by its simultaneous threat. Oppressive language, such as that imposed by the Stalinist state, possesses an intrinsic violence of its own, a capacity to destroy the world, sense, and self-making potential of the word. Toni Morrison summed it up most poignantly within her 1993 Nobel, Nobel Prize lecture, stating, oppressive language does more than represent violence. It is violence. Expressing oneself, private, perhaps divergent accounts of truth or a competing interpretation of reality was, in this sense, a matter of life or death within the Soviet Union. The Soviet citizen was, just, was thus silenced, forced into conformity with the, with the vocabulary of a totalitarian state. The existence of the contemporary artist, author, or musician depended upon a meticulous treading of an often arbitrary party line and an, an adherence to the semantic blueprint, blue, sorry, blueprint of the state-imposed official style of socialist realism. Cultural language assumed a distinctly performative function in its reinforcement of political hegemony, perpetuating a collective truth that, whilst protecting party authority, simply did not exist. Such a rupture between performance and reality went critically unspoken, legitimized by the eternal threat of violence and death. Amidst a public landscape devastated by silence, however, persisted a creative fertility inherent to what remained private or secret. Yevgeny Yevtushenko wrote in his 1963 a precocious autobiography, in Russia, all tyrants believe poets to be their worst enemies. Reflecting upon the Soviet period, Anna Rukmatova represents a powerful example of such an enemy. Through her exhausted throat, out of which 100 million voices shout, a line from the epilogue of her masterpiece, Requiem, Rukmatova constructs a distinctly subverted metaphorical framework acknowledging a buried Soviet terror. I would like us all to pay an intimate visit to the introduction of Requiem, a poem that was written over the period of Stalinist terror, yet only formally published in the Soviet Union amidst the chaos of its collapse. This is a verse that speaks for itself. This was a time when only the dead smiled, glad to have peace, and Leningrad swung from its prisons like an unused limb, and when gone mad from suffering, the condemned regiments were starting off, and the whistles of the locomotives sang short songs of parting. Over us were stars of death, and innocent Russia struggled under the bloodied boot and the tires of the Black Maria. Here, readers are assaulted by a barrage of vivid imagery, severed and unused limbs amongst military regiments driven to insanity. Composed from the late 1930s to the 1950s and circulated only amongst Sigmatova's intimate circle, the history of this text was itself an allegory of the suppression of Soviet memory. Upon its publication amongst Mikhail Gorbachev's 1980s liberalizing reform, Requiem, like many other texts, memoirs, and verse, reunited contemporary populations with a long concealed past. Between the lines of Akhmadova's verse lay a dormant national history, personified by language of the grotesque suffering and death and embodying the trauma of state-sponsored mass violence. Written in private and communicated orally to escape the wrath, wrath of Stalin's secret police, a truth inherent to Requiem is reawakened within the period of collapse. The Russian reader is confronted still, more than 50 years into the future, by the horrors of the Soviet past, a reality never acknowledged within the confines of a state-condoned state state public vocabulary. As post-Soviet society emerged from the world of unofficial lies and artificial accounts, the newly Russian reader found themselves reckoning with a newfound truth and an inherited national trauma of existence-altering proportions. As archives were declassified, death tolls calculated and party lies unraveled, a Pandora's box of destructive confusion was flung open wide. The Soviet Union's institutional collapse marked the tangible demise of an oppressive regime. However, it also encompassed a symbolic opportunity to explore, redefine, and establish masteries over aspects of individual identity. Anna Akhmadova's line, innocent Russia struggled, sorry, um, 
struggled under the bloodied boot and the tires of the Black Maria found poignant meaning and correlation with a finally unearthed historical reality. From the silent ruins of the Soviet world emerged a nascent yet increasingly discernible collective voice. The cultural landscape of the post-Soviet space may, personally be, but may certainly be characterized as a site of rhetorical experimentation, the endeavor of a rhetorically dissented population in constructing new frameworks of existence. There emerged a literature of both absence and absurdity, an explosion of conflicting voices, metaphors, and fantastical depictions of reality. As contemplation of what is real, or does reality even exist, pervaded the mainstream cultural discourse, an overwhelming uncertainty surrounding Russian identity, a quest for lichnost, or personality, remained anchored in history. Through Svetlana Alexeyevich's second-hand time, a Nobel Prize-winning account of the post-Soviet condition, we are enlightened to a population sitting atop the ruins of socialism like it's the aftermath of war, and conversing in a social dialect best described by the statement, our language is the language of suffering. Themes of blood, death, suffering continue to permeate Russian cultural dialects. Returning to the modern day in an April 2022 New York Times article, renowned post-Soviet author Vladimir Sorokin contemplates his own absurdist literary style and his fears of a nightmarish dystopian Russia. Amidst increasing political repression, Sorokin explains that the then recent invasion of Ukraine was not just a military onslaught, but a semantic war waged through propaganda and lies. The author accentuates a powerful intertwining of Russian truth with a national identity rooted in bloodshed and decay. Ruminating upon the question of why there's so much violence in my books, the author reminisces upon his upbringing in a nation where violence was the main air everyone breathed, addressing not just the journalists before him, but an entire world of witnesses to current conflict. Sorokin reflects, I tell them that I was absolutely soaked and marinated in it from kindergarten onward. Putin's memory laws, arbitrary con condemnation of foreign agents and attempts to erase the Ukrainian identity threaten a return to an era of Soviet-style repression and a cultural landscape endowed once more by silence and fear. Through the notion of a returning history, we are introduced to a context where the action of the Russian author is more essential than ever, wielding the dragon-slaying sword of finding the voc right vocabulary with which to articulate truth. The creation of a new world, a system of values, identity, and peace appears dependent upon a collective Russian reconciliation with a traumatic and still uncertain past. Here, the ideas of Judith Butler once again find fertile fitting. Her most recent published work articulates a possibility of ameliorating the destructive capacities of violence through alternative channels of interpretation. To resolve the conflict in Ukraine and release Russian society from a cyclical history of aggression and war, but the suggests that we must cultivate painful memory within mediums that are effective without being destructive. By finding the appropriate language to articulate and acknowledge such an all-consuming history, the cycle of state-sponsored violence and war may at last be broken. This is the power of a literary anti-war protest movement, impactful in its empowerment of alternative private languages of inherited trauma. Butler continues, asserting that to rebuild the bonds of social kinship decimated by violence and terror, we must abandon an individualistic conception of the self. The Russian population must relinquish a long ingrained belief that silence is imperative to survival and release a powerful private voice in the collective public sphere. In the words of journalist Anna Polik Polikovskaya in 2004, shortly prior to her assassination in 2006, Putin's Russia hurtles back into the Soviet abyss, an information vacuum that spells death from our own ignorance. A statement from almost 20 years ago that proves increasingly fertile. Purveyors of the Russian truth must find an alternative means to be heard. In the modern day, the internet has become a space of intimate yet far-reaching calls for protest, a surviving medium, according to Polikovskaya, where information is still freely available, at least in 2004. Today, the freedom of social media's universal language is ever encroached upon by Putin's state. Many sites, however, continue to provide a venue for the expression of the distinctly personal tragedy that is Putin's war in Ukraine to many Russian people. Daria Serenko, a co-founder of the feminist anti-war resistance movement now exiled from her Russian homeland, publishes her work via Facebook and Instagram. I would like to read an excerpt from the poem Bridegrooms, composed in 2022 and translated by Eugene Ostashevsky. When dead blue bridegrooms from Russia come back from the war, they lie down forever in bed with their brides. They are lying between clean sheets as if they were lying in coffins, and the still living women are lying next to them as if they were lying in coffins. And all the people in every prefabricated concrete high-rise are lying as if they were lying in coffins. And they are horrifying, these bridegrooms. They are not just blue and reeking like an abattoir. 
They also have individual injuries. The guts of one are hanging loose. Half the face of another is baked together and runny, yet another is missing both legs. It is hard to love bridegrooms like these, but it isn't easy to bury them either. The women sigh and lie down beside them, trying to conceal their revulsion because they feel pity. They have no more strength, no more tears. They don't know what he died for, and it is not possible to ask or remember any more whether he loved. Bridegrooms keep to themselves now. Those who still have fingers can merely point soundlessly at something. The other day, one was sitting with his mouth open and poking his finger at it. His bride thought he was asking for food, put a piece of bread soaked in milk under his swollen tongue, but the bread, tum bread tumbled out, unchewed. The final stanza. Of course the women would have preferred the living. It felt so good to kiss them under the apple blossoms in the first days of May, or to save up together for a seaside vacation, or to drink tea with rolls from the kiosk on the way to work, or to send them to the all-night store for sprats in tomato sauce during the first pregnancy. At night, lying beside their immovable dead, they fantasize about the living. God be their judge. In an interview for the New York Review of Books, Sarenko touches upon the complex and gruesome maze of thought underpinning her work. When questioned about the online response to this poem, she proceeds in an explanation of two kinds of reactions, overwhelming the comments. Many Russians wrote that the absurd realism of the text gave them goosebumps, and they thanked me. Other Russians found it nauseating and cynical, and they asked, Daria, it's horrible. In our world anyway, why do you multiply the darkness and the horror? Why did you write this thing? She replies, I would answer that it is not the responsibility of literature to offer support and pleasure. Literature can do that but it doesn't have to. The power of writing, according to Serenko, lies not within its beauty. It is a capacity for confrontation to thrust into the spotlight a dark and painful Russian history that is recognized to call a silent population to loud and powerful action. From the lines of bridegroom's clamber's history, lying beside the Russian citizen as they sleep, screaming to be felt amidst the new cycle of war. As Igmatova's Leningrad symbolically swung from its prisons like an unused limb, Serenko stares at a generation of the grotesque living dead directly in the eyes. For they are horrifying, these bridegrooms. Their guts are hanging loose. Half the face of another is baked together and runny, yet another is missing both eyes. Serenko calls to her people through a language of death, to a population who have been historically conditioned to sigh and lie down, try to con conceal their revulsion. In this moment, the Western world may finally begin to understand. Of course, the women would have preferred the living to escape from their rotting, immovable dead. Such freedom, however, is just not that simple. The pull of, of Putin's artificial history is strong, however, by no means is it destiny. For many modern citizens bowed under the weight of returning repression, Russia will win by losing the war in Ukraine. The Russian national identity has possessed a historic familiarity with violence. It is through a redirection of the language of such a past. It's a non-destructive and encouraging linguistic forms, however, that the Russian people might be freed. The strongest practice of resistance to Putin's politics is best encapsulated by this quote, in my opinion, by Mikhail Shishkin, reading, if everything is a fiction in the Russian political system, then the Russophone writer must outfiction the regime by calling the ogre by its name. The importance of defining, reveling within, and screaming out loud one's heritage is the most important lesson for the international community. An essential reminder that not everything we see, read, hear, or are told may be determined as truth. Our history is powerful, and its realization within modern political discourse shapes our own private existence in ways we might not immediately understand. We must exercise, above all, an ability to determine what is our own truth. In this sense, Russian traumatic past must not be avoided, but embraced by a population of authors, poets, and artists, if ever it is to be overcome. I will leave you this morning with one final quote, written by Amina Sriyansavan within the online journal Isolari, a publication seeking orientation for a deteriorating world. She writes, what is that unruly thing that cannot be named, that cannot be brought to heel by words? It would be foolish to try to say, but sometimes the poets slit open the night and give us a glimpse. Amongst the stars in our night sky shines history. We must never stop searching for it. Thank you. <laughs>
it is also undeniable that wars are started and finished in the grips of human subjectivity, of ideas, opinions, and stories. In my research experience, this understanding is nowhere more relevant than in the long historical relationship between Russia and its Eastern European neighbors. Now, in the context of current unspeakable events in Ukraine, I think of the historical narrative and its impact on Russian foreign policy as a valuable framework through which the invasion might be better understood. Russian foreign policy emerges from ideas about the territorial and imperial heredity of a strong state and does not predictably act according to universal rules of great power or liberal cooperation. These ideas are historically based and politically rehearsed. With this project, I've explored how the Russian relationship with Ukraine is specifically defined by historical conceptions of Moscow as the heir to the medieval Kievan Rus state, as well as the orthodox successor to Rome as a European center of culture and power. This is an investigation of how the Moscow as the third Rome concept has been specifically reworked, reimagined, and manipulated at different points in Russian history to serve political and nationalist ends and now represents a key pillar of Putin's justification for the war in Ukraine. As defined by historical sociologist Anthony Smith, nation building involves the active construction of shared identity. This process is based on a collective experience of specific ideas, myths, and symbols of a common past, which are consciously curated and expressed over time. Other scholars have written extensively on the significance of history, memory, and national chronicles, which transcend the mere structures of statehood. Accurate historical truth, as we know it, and fiction are often co-constitutive in forces in narratives which serve to unify communities, legitimize power and territory, and ultimately provide a sense of shared purpose and identity to groups of people who don't know each other personally. In discussions of this nation-building process, Russia and its Eastern European neighbors present an interesting case. It has been argued that the establishment of modern nationhood and national identity in the region has been particularly contested as a result of much historical fragmentation. In this context, early modern stories which conferred comforting and legitimizing precedent for a nation group's existence, autonomy, or territorial location became incredibly popular with the rise of nationalism in the 19th century. Given the significant role of the Orthodox Church and the translation of the Bible into local vernacular in the 19th century, religious narratives from the, from the medieval period had particular power. Thus, as the Russian Empire sought to expand its imperial reach and justify its conservative culture of government, tales of continuity between Kiev and Rus and Muscovy, Rome and Muscovy, became very important for national identity. The Russian and Eastern European region is described as having been fragmented in the breakdown of medieval Kievan Rus during a period of Mongol control. Kievan or Kievan Rus in Russian and Ukrainian respectively was a medieval state which held power in Central and Eastern Europe between the 9th and 13th centuries. Its borders fluctuated at different points during this period and administration shifted to a confederation of princely states in the final decades before Mongol conquest in the, 9th, in the 13th century. Um, while the cultural and vernacular linguistic unity of Kievan Rus territory remained relatively weak, the medieval state was a powerful international actor. Under the rule of Vladimir I, Kievan Rus underwent Orthodox Christian conversion as a condition of an agreement with the Byzantine Emperor Basil II for Vladimir to marry his sister. The popularization of Orthodox traditions and rites was facilitated by the translation of biblical texts into a version of the Slavonic vernacular. This transfer of religious culture from Constantinople to Kievan Rus would come to represent a crucial historical milestone for Russian and Ukrainian national identity. The story of Prince Vladimir's conversion has, like Moscow as the Third Rome, been used to build national identity. Today, even the legacy of Prince Vladimir the Great remains subject of great debate between Russian and Ukrainian national historians, each claiming the Christianizing hero as their own. Kievan Rus was weakened to the point of dissolution after the conquest, of, conquest by the <laughs> invading Mongol Empire in the 13th century. Over the following 150 years, former centers of power among Rus principalities became scattered and disjoint, 
Only when Mongol control began to weaken in the 14th and 15th centuries did one of them, Muscovy, achieve prominence through expanding rule over its neighbors. The question of continuity between old Kievan Rus and the rise of the Muscovite state is at the center of contemporary claims about Russian Kievan heredity. Its growing power was consolidated by Ivan the Terrible in the 16th century into the Sardom, which was the precursor to the Russian Empire established and expanded under Peter the Great 200 years later. This lineage is emphasized in Russian national historiography as part of an unbroken chain between Russia and Kievan Rus, with the implication of entitlement to territories in Ukraine and Belarus, which were once a part of the medieval state. But Russian historical narratives of continuity with past empires extend far beyond Kievan Rus. The myth of Moscow as the third Rome, also referred to as a case of translatio imperi, or the transfer of empire in Latin, is an Orthodox Christian story which describes how the power of the Roman Empire passed to Byzantium and then to Russia. First articulated in the letters of the monk Philotheus of Sakov, or Philophe, between 15 in 1505 and 1510, the narrative explains the transfer of divine ordinance from Rome to Orthodox Constantinople and finally to Moscow, with reference to the apocalypse in the Book of Revelations. This idea would have been deeply influenced by the recent fall of the Byzantine Empire and an imperative of Russian Orthodox independence from the Patriarchate of Constantinople. Moreover, theological discussion during this period reflected an Orthodox Christian apocalyptic prophecy which foretold the end of the world to come any time after the year 7000 or 1492 CE. While this prophecy clearly had not yet come to pass, clerical writings of this period are infused with a deep feeling of anxiety about the coming of the end times. In this context, Philophe named Moscow, the third and final seat of the Christian church, which had been betrayed by heresy in both Rome and Constantinople. In his letters, he writes, two Romes have fallen, the third stands, and there will be no fourth. This theory served to invest the rising power of Moscow with greatly increased spiritual authority. While Philophe's writings align with an era of great expansion, flourishing, and an increase in power for the, for the Moscovite state, Translatio Imperi concept remained purely religious during this period. As the Russian state and Orthodox ecclesiastical law evolved, so too did the perception and use of Philophase theory. For several centuries, descriptions of Moscow as the Third Rome became rare outside of old believer communities. However, all of this would change with the emergence of modern nationalism in the 19th century. This ideological shift gave the concept of Russian symbolic, religious, and cultural authority over the Eastern Orthodox world new significance. The sudden reappearance of Translatio Imperi in Russian historiography of the imperial age is a fascinating example of the co-optation of originally apolitical narratives for purposes of nationalism. In this model, medieval religious stories from Russia and Ukraine's past are repurposed to help justify modern political and imperial ideas. With the rise of Romanticism and the rhetorical imperatives of imperial expansion, the idea that Russia had a hereditary and divine right to authority over the region became highly convenient. In this context, Philophase theory was revisited and reimagined in combination with the narrative of continuity with Kievan Rus by a new crop of Russian nationalist historians. In 1861, a. Pavlov published Philophe's letters, officially reintroducing the primary sources to public and scholarly discourse for the first time in centuries. What followed was a flurry of rapid publishing from historians interested in reproducing the concept of Moscow as the Third Rome in the contemporary context of the Russian Empire. Fascinatingly, this process involved scholarly error as scholars built off one another's analysis without consulting the original epistolary sources. One expansive account published by a certain V. N. Malanin in 1901 has been credited with a number of chronological inaccuracies which can be found reproduced in others' work. Moreover, the Translatio Imperi concept reinterpreted as something of a theoretical ancestor to 19th century Russian messianism. This nationalist ideology posited Russia as a chosen nation with the right and duty to lead Eastern Europe in religious and political thought. 
this convenient repurposing of a religious story allowed for its application to imperial Russian regional domination. Among those who made use of Translatio Imperi this, in this way were I. Kirilov and N. F. Fyodorov, who made it a key part of his bizarre, immortalist philosophy of the common task. The concept of Moscow as the Third Rome was presented in their writings as both a key to the past and a path into the future. Interpreting Philofay's letters as expressing a project of the 16th century, Fyodorov specifically argued that the concept entailed a duty of the Russian fatherland to unite and lead all Christians. He used this idea to argue for universal military conscription in the Russian Empire. Yet another interpretation presented Philofay's declaration of Moscow as the Third Rome in the context of the medieval cleric's expectation of the apocalypse, that perhaps through the righteous governance of Russia, Philofay believed the end times could be avoided. This positioning of Russia as a vanguard and righteous savior gradually gained popularity, and the translatio imperi concept became increasingly common in nationalist and historical texts. Its reinterpretation continued through the 20th century when Russian messianism was refashioned to fit Leninist goals and Stalinist presentations of Soviet greatness and independence from hostile imperialist powers. The reimagined trope of Moscow as the Third Rome served to generate national identity and provide justification for imperial expansion. In these colonized territories, including Ukraine, this entailed the suppression of local national identity and vernacular liter literature through the 19th century. Gradually losing its religious context and connotation, Russian translatio imperi has in more recent historiography referred to a mantle of regional, cultural, political, and economic authority borne by the Russian government over its Eastern European neighbors. Implicit though it might be, the myth is rehearsed in the rhetoric of Russian foreign policy as it relates to Eastern Europe and Ukraine specifically. <clears throat> Narratives about Russian imperial, religious, and territorial heredity <laughs> have, argued, have been argued to have significant impact on foreign policy and the decision to <clears throat> invade Ukraine. The most compelling evidence for this idea comes directly from the official statements of the Kremlin and Putin himself. In his July 2021 article on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians, the president combs through the history of Ukrainian territorial administration since Kiev and Rus in order to argue that the two peoples are one. The dominating power of previous iterations of the Russian state in the region is used as evidence of ethnic, cultural, religious, linguistic, and national unity. He identifies a Western-sponsored anti-Russian project which has taken root in Ukraine, rewritten history, and inspired the rejection of Russian influence and control, which manifested in the 2014 Euromaidan crisis. Equally important to this ideational legit legitimation of present aggressive Russian foreign policy is the position of Vladimir Putin himself as a strong central leader to which the grand narrative of Russian paternalistic regional uh, leadership would be relevant. There is evidence of Putin's attempts to do so for himself and his administration from his earliest days in power. His administration has made plays at both imperial and religious legitimation, Putin has made repeated reference in his own, to his own orthodox beliefs and to Russia's Christian roots, implying conservative religious morality as a legitimizing force for Russian regional authority. President Putin has also made several trips to the holy mountain of Athos in Greece, a seat of orthodox Christian faith and leadership so sacred that women have not been allowed to visit for centuries. His first attempt in 2001 failed, ironically, due to <laughs> inclement weather, an act of God, so to speak. However, he has since returned on multiple occasions, each time citing the foundational importance of the Orthodox Church for Russians. In doing so, Putin has established himself as a strong leader and a protector of the faith, not only for Russia, but for all of the Orthodox world, which includes much of Eastern Europe, as well as some EU member states. This is a form of religious legitimation for his power, which also harkens back to the, to the czars, who throughout the 19th century represented the holy site's most generous, generous patrons. Buying land and sponsoring monasteries, the Russian Empire once sought to solidify its place as keeper of orthodoxy, much like Philofay predicted. It seems that in the past two decades, President Putin has sought to do the same. 
the repurposing of medieval religious narratives to legitimize territorial expansion illustrates the evolution of historiography for national identity in Russia and Eastern Europe. Not only does the Russian state have a historical right to Ukrainian territory in this framework, but it emanates cultural, political, and economic authority, which has, as Putin has explicitly argued, represented a civilizational counterweight to the liberal Western world. The preeminence of historical continuity and symbolic regional authority, even in contemporary politics, is profoundly different from historiographical norms in the West. Today, nationalist interpretations of Translatio Imperi rhetorically place Putin's state in a position of paternalistic regional entitlement. This phenomenon is powerful and dangerous and serves to illustrate the significance of historical narratives, their construction and rehearsal from nationalism. Hello, everybody. I'm Peter Holquist. I teach modern Russian and modern European history in the history department. Um, thank you for coming today, and I want to thank Julio for inviting me to serve as moderator. Um, I want to thank both Olive and Rose. It is always an inspiring experience to read excellent and thoughtful research by dedicated and smart undergraduates, and particularly uh, for this panel because they're both addressing you know, very urgent and very painful topics of the present day. Um, for me, I cannot but read these through the lens of the course that I'm now teaching, which is the Napoleonic era through Tolstoy's War and Peace, which uh, meditates very much on what is Russia's place in the world and role in history. Um, let me uh, begin my uh, comments uh, with an observation, a general observation. And that is um, that um, I approach these papers as a historian. And both Olive uh, and Rose come from different disciplines. So Olive is a political science. Anna Reese. Anna Rush. And, and, and they're, they're both Reese majors, but it's additionally a political science yes. major. And you are an, are an IR major. Yes. And I, I view the world through my lens as a historian. And I bring this up because uh, generally historians want to nuance and complicate and multiply things. That is, historians are splitters rather than lumpers. We are the foxes rather than the hedgehogs. Um, so this is going to be um, uh, the, the lens through which I approach the papers, which speaks more to methodological differences in how different disciplines approach questions uh, than to the individual papers. So Olive's paper, Finding the Word, Searching for Truth in the Shadows of the Soviet Past, examined languages of violence, death, and suffering as an endeavor to, to reclaim political autonomy and sovereignty over the body and the self. Here, trauma is presented as a cycle of repressions, death, and violence that produce a particular cultural idiom. Um, and the focus in Olive's paper is very much um, the repression, violence, and trauma of the 20th century, the Soviet past. Um, Olive uh, presents the special operation, Putin's name for the war that must not be called war, as having many different faces. Um, uh, what is interesting is that this paper presents the self-legitimization of, of the uh, campaign, which is, of course is being challenged, as you point out, by a social media sphere that questions some of these assertions. Putin is seeking, says Olive, to rebuild a polity based on a predetermined national greatness. Um, and here I had a question that is honestly for both of you and is, is an honest question. Um, is Putin seeking a polity predicated on national greatness or on imperial greatness? That is, is, is it the greatness of um, Kiev and Rus, um, or is it the greatness of a Soviet polity that was an imperial and not just a Russian project? Um, we have here a story of the Russian people engaging in a long, complex relationship with truth and that this relationship is mediated through repression. Olive here refers to Stalin's repression of the period of the Great Break and the terror, the uh, violent arrest and executions of uh, Russia's people by the Soviet state, and here invokes uh, Anna Akhmatova. Um, but here is where I put on my historian's hat, and I say, 
this is, this is certainly very true, um, but this heritage of repression and violence is equally true for other post-Soviet polities and societies for Ukraine itself. Um, that is, in a sense, the treatment here is equating the experience of Soviet repression entirely and totally with the Russian experience. So how does um, reflecting on how other po post-Soviet societies have been able to address and mediate this uh, trauma uh, reflect on how the Russian society is, is able to do this? Um, so we see that um, what is going on, says Olive, is trying to find the, searching for the truth in the shadows of the Soviet past looking at uh, Evgeny Yevtushenko and Anna Akhmatova. I, I want to hear, uh, again, as where my head as a historian, pose a question. Um, here, memory is largely operating in the world of high culture and literature. Sorokhin, Akhmatova, Yevtushenko. So what, what realms, um, what uh, social groups are affected by this particular form of uh, uh, working through the past, and what are other media, for instance, television, or uh, as you point out, uh, 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 the uh, uh, social media. We have a, here a trauma of uh, repressions, a, a trauma of a cycle of repressions, death, and violence that have produced in contemporary Russia a particular cultural idiom. Um, and I, here I pulled up and I wondered, or, or has it? Because you, you do have this woman you've cited who is forming a feminist anti-war group. Uh, we have people who are opposing this, but at the, eight, at the same time, and we in the West speak about this much less, uh, there are many in Russia who are willingly and eagerly embracing this. I mean, this, this, so, this post-Soviet past produces both the woman you're speaking of, but also people like Alexander Dugan, who is the official ideologist of this operation. Um, so uh, uh, here I would ask, uh, how has the particular Russian navigation, mediation of this trauma uh, differed from how other societies that have the same Soviet violent heritage moved? For Rose, uh, this is a question, and I sh I'm going to uh, be very clear here. Um, Rose, it's a fine job of emphasizing the myths which are being instrumentalized and deployed by the contemporary Russian government. So in a sense, you had to do, you had two, two tasks on your hand. One is explicating what they're talking about, which is the past, but you insist very much in this paper that it's about the present and their a deployment distortion, instrumentalization of it. Um, this is how Russian foreign policy emerges from ideas about the territorial and imperial heredity of a strong state with two particular myths, the idea of Kiev and Rus and the Orthodox heritage and the idea of Translatio Empiri and the idea of a third Rome. Here, the current conflict grows from historical conceptions of Moscow as heir to these two traditions. Um, here is where I wondered, in, in, in what spheres and by what means? So is this, uh, how is this being actualized? How does the rubber actually hit the road? Um, and just, I would point out here, um, at least in the initial portions of the uh, paper, um, this is presented very much in a passive voice, which is what drove me to wonder, who, is, is this Putin? Is this Russia's foreign ministry? Is this a collective psyche or public consciousness about this that is thinking about this? Uh, we have repeated uh, historical and administrative fragmentation in Eastern Europe, which these myths seek to overcome, stitching together these spaces underneath the paternalistic guidance of a Russian state. Here the historical context is Kiev and Rus and Muscovy. But as I asked for all of the apologies that emerge from this, such as uh, uh, Ukraine, Lithuania, um, that have a similar heritage but have come out very differently. Uh, there is a, the insistence that this Translatio Empiri, um, which was uh, invoked 
in between 1505 and 1510, was rediscovered in the mid-19th century and deployed uh, by nationalist historians. Um, this is uh, ideational legitimization that is then inherited by uh, uh, the Putinist state. Here the emphasis is on the role of the orthodoxy and the orthodox world. Um, here I, I'd, I'd also point to, and in your presentation you mentioned this, the extent to which the, the contemporary Putinist regime, even before 2022, um, was invoking its solidarity with traditional values um, of all confessions, Catholicism, but also Islam. I mean, there's, it's, it's not an accident, as we say, in East China, that uh, Putin, before 2022, was very strongly identifying himself with uh, Poland and its Law and Justice Party and Orban in Hungary all united as defending European traditional values against a liberal and perverted West. Um, so the Third Rome is, is, is the key touch point for these state claims. Um, I here wondered whether this is about the worldview of the decision makers, Putin and Mead. Is this a story of state propaganda, which is somewhat different than government policy, or are we talking about the um, public opinion and public attitudes in Russian society? Um, now, uh, I'm going to simply conclude by um, posing some general questions to both of you that emerged, as I th thought, with your papers together, because it's, it's, it's very interesting that we have a focus on the 20th century period of Soviet trauma and the deep past of the Orthodox tradition from Kiev and Rus and of the Third Rome phenomenon. So first of all, what I'd want to put on the table is, it's a big question, what is Russia? When you're using Russia here, is this the formal understanding of the Russian Federation that is a concept of sovereignty in the political realm? Is it the formal position of the Russian government and state? Or does it reflect a spectrum of views within Russian society? Secondly, is this Putinist project a nationalist project? This is, I was uh, asked you, uh, uh, Olive, particularly on this. Or is it an imperialist project? Um, I'll point out that many of the tanks that, are, that Russian forces are driving in Ukraine are driving under Soviet flags. They, they've, they've resurrected the Soviet flag. And what does that mean about a Russian national um, identity? Um, how does this emphasis uh, on the specifically Russian nature, either of suffering or of its particular past, get played out in a Russian Federation that's inherited the cosmopolitanism of the Soviet past? So for instance, Putin is very proud to have founded a Jewish museum in Moscow. Or even more to the point, um, at Poklona Gara, which is the site of Victory Park, the central memorial site for the uh, commemoration of the Second World War. There is, of course, um, a truly grotesque Orthodox chapel that, um, when the war broke out, had a, a mural painted in it that was mind-blowing. But equally, at Paklona Gara, you have a Jewish chapel and a Muslim mosque which is a, a, a project to demonstrate that it is a multi-confessional uh, Russian post-Soviet space. Or um, how can we think about the role of non-ethnic Russians who are inhabiting a Russian federation through this? And I'll just give you some, some names and players as defenders of the Putinist special operation. Sergei Shoigu, who's the defense minister, who is um, uh, the son of a Tuvan father and a Ukrainian mother, and is identifiably Tuvan. Or the, the premier apologist on Russian television for the special operation and Putin's government, Margarita Simonyan, who of course is Armenian. In fact, her family had escaped the Ottoman Empire, it had escaped the genocide of the Armenians, I mean, talk about multiple iterations of trauma. Um, uh, 
uh, and whose family was deported by the Soviet Stalinist state to Kazakhstan in World War II, but nevertheless ends up being an apologist for this particular project. Or if we want to operate in the realm of high culture, the most preeminent composer, uh, not composer, conductor um, uh, today in the Russian Federation, Valery uh, Gergiev, who is a Cetian and famously conducted the orchestra at Palmyra, Syria, as a way to celebrate the um, foreign policy and military feats of, of the Russian state. In both papers, this uh, assertion of Russianness makes one wonder who is the other in this model of Russianness? Is it the non Orthodox world? Um, is it the Soviet state um, and the past that you're trying to escape? Um, One silence or absence that I found notable in both papers was the absence of the Great Patriotic War. For instance, you talk very much about the, 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 the 20th century violence, heritage, and trauma, focusing on the domestic repressive side of things. But the, in terms of the legitimization of the project, and also in terms of the deep trauma caused in the 20th century, to all Soviet spaces. The, the, the Great Patriotic War was truly foundational. Um, and this is equally true. That you, uh, Rose talks very much about the invocation of the deep past, but there's also the total instrument, instrumentalization of the recent past and the Second World War. So in a sense, I, I guess, I guess uh, there's also a methodological tension between these two papers in this sense. For Olive, the driving force to explain what's going on now is the heritage of the trauma of the 20th century in the Russian space. Whereas for Rose, it's very much the present day. That is, it's not the deep past, it's the, it's the contemporary Russian government's instrumentalization of that deep past. So is it, it's, it's, it's a classic Russian question, who is to blame? Is it, is it the Putinist government today that's to blame? Or is it the heritage of the Soviet past that makes them, that they cannot help but being what they are? Um, I want to thank you both for stupendous papers that I think are wonderfully in dialogue with one another. So thank you. I'd like to, um, first, you've been very, very patient uh, through all of this. So I first want to ask if there are any questions for our two presenters. Um, and having collected some questions, maybe ask both of you to respond. Yes, Julia. I actually have uh, wait, wait, wait. a question. Uh, no, I, I, that's not really a question. I, I would <laughs> like them to respond right away. Okay, good. <laughs> because, I'm, because I think that you uh, asked uh, excellent questions, and some of the questions would be mine as well. So... Um, why don't we, if no one objects, why, why don't we just go into their answers? Who wants to go first? Go first. Okay. Um, first of all, I thought, wait, just, hello. First of all, I thought those were all incredibly important questions, and I would say that I had a little note on the side of my paper about inserting the Great Patriotic War, and I now am kicking myself for not doing it, because I agree. It is an incredibly dominant narrative, and I think, well, especially within Putin's contemporary discourse, and I think that... Um, you raised some incredible points about a conflation between Soviet identity and a Russian identity and a dealing with the trauma and the different ways of mm. all the post-Soviet and satellite regions. Um, I think that the objective of my paper more broadly was to concentrate on the role of, of narratives and the kind of a dealing with an implementation of these nuanced and kind of like a collective experience, uh, a narrative of a collective experience within um, political language rather than maybe a more kind of direct focus on the events mm -hmm. themselves and I think that I mean it, I completely agree that it is not also so, a phenomenon that's limited to the to the Soviet period I think you know especially I agree that our, our papers are in fantastic dialogue with each other in the sense that across hundreds of years of, of Russian history this phenomenon of kind of looking back to the past and recycling kind of 
narratives of greatness and victory and imperial strength um, are consistent. I think my recollection is not 100% spot on, but I think Peter the Great also was guilty of a similar thing. Um, but, and Stalin, of course, with the narrative of Peter the Great. But um, I think that in terms of your, your use of the term high culture, what I perceive, I, I thought that was an, an interesting term to use in the sense that, yes, poetry, literature, art is a, is a form of high culture, but I think it possesses a very interesting and unique application within mm -hmm. specifically the Soviet context in the sense that it was instrumentalized as such a legitimizing political tool. And I think that something that I personally find so captivating about the, the Russian identity, however you define that, is kind of a, a love and a, an adoration and a kind of Familiar, uh, f familiarity, almost a, a familial relationship with, with the poetry of, of Russia's past um, that almost, I think, renders the term high culture almost redundant in that sense, mm -hmm. if you'll agree with me. But uh, well, I'd have two questions about that. Number one is, is the extent to which one should approach um, works of art and literature as expressions of collective identity mm -hmm as opposed to the works of individual authors mediating their own individual experiences. Um, but secondly, my, my, my thought about high culture is driven very much by the, the sociology of the war and its impact on Russian society, where it's very clear that the urban educated elites um, have, have either gone into inner immigration or have emigrated outside the country. And the war, at the end of the days, is very much a war of the poor poor regions of the Russian Federation, many of them not ethnically Russian, Buryatia, Tuva, mm -hmm. Dagestan, um, and of uh, the, the Russian countryside. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering sort of what is the overlap sociologically of the world that, what accounts for the different political responses, say, of those social groups and those regions, as opposed to the urban educated elites, yes. which have ended up being much more critical? I think that's a fantastic question. And I, I think, I think that within both respective parties, you can conceive of a kind of a cohesive narrative within both and a kind of a creation of different narratives in relation to these differing identities. You speak of the Buryat Buddhist sorry, populations who also constructed a number, an incredible number of, of, of narratives and, and methods and the story of the blue elephant, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm reconciling and dealing, not, I mean, not reconciling, that's the wrong word, but kind of surviving the, the period of Stalin's trauma, sorry, Stalin's terror. Um, I think that narrative finds fertile footing and, and discourse and, and kind of stories that pertain to live experience but represent uh, identity in, in every facet of kind of the existence even in the Western world, I think right. more that's something that we're seeing more and more. Sorry, I hope that made sense. <laughs> no, it did. You've been very patient. <laughs> oh, well, I talked for a long time, so the break was well needed. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for your commentary and your questions. It's much appreciated, and thank you for bringing synthesis to two very different, uh, similarly inclined, but um, admittedly methodologically different uh, pieces of research. And I think that's, that's where I would start. You asked a lot of questions, and that's where I'm going to start, is just if I were to have an opportunity to, say, rewrite my Russian thesis, I would love for our two papers to be two different chapters of the same, <laughs> of the same uh, thesis. I think... And for that reason, I'm going to start with a question that was originally posed for Olive, whether um, this project, this uh, this special operation, <laughs> is a, is nationalist or imperialist or how, how. And I think my answer to that is, for Putin, it's one and the same. Um, and whether or not I agree with that idea, in context outside of his government, I. I don't think matters. I think, and that points to, well, first, I'll, I'll note you mentioned the presence of, in Moscow, 
memorials to different faiths, Mm -hmm. recognition of the ethnic heterogeneity of the Russian state. Um, I think of, like, I'm pretty sure it's Gorky Park where there are uh, monuments to different um, ethnic groups in Russia. And therein, I think, is the answer to that nationalist, um, imperialist question. Uh, To Putin, (laughs) Russia as a nation is empire in that I don't think he quite minds that those in Dagestan may worship in a mosque and speak a different language and identify differently. They are Russians and his subjects, subjects um, that are made to be Russian following a, a blueprint that has been built on century by century. And that's where my deep historical work sort of comes in because the the key word that I I think underwrote every line in my paper and I yet I, I'm not sure I, it even <laughs> what appeared in, in my little speech, but is autocracy. Mm-hmm. And that's you ask, well, is this is this Putin? Is this the Russian people? Is there a difference? I think, yes, there's certainly a difference. Um, We see in this country how different um, parts of a population can be led to think in different ways according to the... the, the ideation... The the media sphere. Yes, (laughs) the information environment. Um, I think that he has followed, and this is where... I really see Olive's paper and mine as two sides of the same coin, reflecting um, maybe different aspects. Mine is uh, sort of top-down, hers is bottom-up, but of the same process, a dialogue between a series of Russian states that have been autocratic Mm -hmm. and have subjected their people to a series of layered, different, and yet, co-constitutive propagandas, different, different arenas of the same narratives that have been used over and over again. This is, what Putin is doing is, it's not original, and it, he, is, he is copying Stalin in the same way Stalin copied the czars who copied. It, it just goes back, and I think there is the story that I wish I could tell in, in, a, in a longer piece of writing would be the, the dialogue between the Russian state and its people, which I do think as Olive's, um, the, the literary works she referenced, like so illustrate, is it is a dialogue. It's not, this, this war is not reflective of the will of the Russian people as a whole. Um, while certain groups of people, while huge swaths of the rural population may have been um, understandably convinced by Mm -hmm. a corrupted media, I think that there is evidence of of a dialogue between the Russian people and the state that just, Mm -hmm. it illustrates just that. It is an, an autocratic, imperialist state for whom or for which I say for whom because I think of one man at the center of it. Um, nation and empire are the same, and whether that is rooted personally for him in a feeling of domestic political insecurity or paranoia, that's hard to, and probably not worth anyone's time to psychoanalyze, but I think all of these ideas come together to answer that first question, like empire or nation. For him, it's the same, and it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. No, as I said, when I put it, Pose the question. It, it, for me, it's an honest question yeah. because I wonder about these mm-hmm. things and the, the way in which that tension between empire and nation has worked out even in the imperial period. Mm-hmm. There's a historian, Jeffrey Hosking, who says, it, it, in a sense, it was it, the existence of empire prevented the full elaboration and development of an idea of a Russian national identity, mm-hmm. which um, echoes then throughout the 20th century. I want to thank you both for kicking off this conference in such a fine way. Um, We're going to end now so that you can stay on time and on schedule. Uh, Congratulations on your wonderful, wonderful work. Thank you.